Hello, beautiful people, and welcome, hi, to the Wanderer post-release analysis! Woohoo! To preface this, I just want to make it very clear. If you don't care about meta, that's completely fine. If you're someone who wants to spend money on the game, okay. When I evaluate units, I don't assume that most people do. And so I don't assume that you've spent $200 on the Wanderer banner. For that reason, I don't assume that you have C6 Ferris on. Because as it turns out, getting C6 of a new four-star character on a limited banner is, on average, a lot more wishes than getting your C0 five-star. It's closer to getting a C1 to C2 five-star than getting a C0. And just like I don't assume Constellation 1 or Constellation 2 when I do the post-release on a character or the pre-release on a character or any videos on characters unless otherwise specified, then I don't assume C6 Farazhan in this situation because she's too new for it to be likely that there's a lot of people that have her C6 with C0 Wanderer. There are going to be some people. It's possible that it's you. One of the accounts that I tested did have C6 Farazhan with C0 Wanderer, but it's statistically pretty unlikely, which means that, well, if I want my video to be accurate for most people, I can't assume that. But that said, let's get right into the post-release. Now, post-releases, if you're new here, you might not know, basically what I do is I go through my pre-release videos after having done a bunch of testing on a character. I re-watch my pre-release video and I talk about what I got wrong, what I got right, kind of holding myself accountable, I mean, correcting myself if need be. So, great rate ascension the crit rate ascension is obviously always nice, depending on the kind of stat distributions you have and the kind of buffs you get and the kind of artifacts you end up being able to go for. At a baseline, damage percent ascension is better than crit ascension. Right, it's going to depend on which set you end up using. It's going to depend on whether or not you use him with Farazhan, but uh, about as good as fair-ish. If you don't use Farazhan, right, you don't have this 36, it would be a little bit better to get a damage ascension. If you do use Farazhan, it's a little bit better to get the crit ascension. Overall, it doesn't change that much. The base mm -hmm. defense and the base HP are actually relevant. These yep. are very low. Yeah, that actually does matter. One of the upsides that Wanderer has is that he hovers just high enough to be over a bunch of attacks from some enemies, which means that when you're against those enemies, he feels like untouchable. But when you're against any enemies that can hit him in the air, a lot of the attacks just one shot him. Initially when he came out it was while Aeon Blight Drake was in Abyss. When I was doing shieldless testing, I would get two shot basically by the Aeon Blight Drake. And it was pretty frustrating because other characters wouldn't get two shot and he would and it felt like shit. I was dying through Bennett Burst. I know it's skill issue but it's still relevant. How squishy a character is can still be relevant so that's basically just another thing to I guess keep in mind. Running out of Kukorioku points will end the win favored state. A second cast during the duration of win favored will also end it. Here are the important lines in here. The damage they deal in their AoE will be increased. Okay, here's here's the thing, okay? Their AoE will be increased is kind of a lie. All right, your normal attacks basically don't have AoE. Like, they have a little bit against, like, specific enemies that, like, specifically, like, end up packing themselves together. Or if you're, like, running Venti on your team. If you have C6 Farazhan, kinda, but not even really. Technically, he has AoE on his, on, on his normal attacks, but most of the time, you can consider his normal attacks to be single target and his charge attacks to be his AoE. It seems like you get up to four particles. I'm not entirely sure on that, but let's for now assume that. Okay, so from what I understand, it's one particle every two seconds in his E. Every two seconds that, you, that like, if you hit an attack, you get a particle. Generally, you'll get four to five from what I understand. I think there's a trick you can do. Like, if you, if you, let me go double check it because I, I, I saw that somewhere. I've been told there was a way to make it so you get, like, guarantee it so you get five. Ah, maybe that's it. Yeah, that was five. Okay. It seems like you gain particles when your attacks hit, not when you cast them, while you're in your E. But it seems like it also works if you activate your E in between your attack getting thrown and your attack hitting. So if you do N1E, you get a particle. As a baseline, even though you stay on the field for more than eight seconds, it's very hard to get five particles when you're doing normal attack spam because the way that your attacks end up lining up, you get it on the first, and then you get it on the third. And then you get it on the first. And then you get it on the third. And then you would get it on the first here. But that's, you don't actually get that. Uh, I think if you do charge attacks, it's a little bit easier. No, it's not. Yeah, no, we still got four. But yeah, basically, timing it so that you get five every time is pretty difficult, like, at a baseline. But if you start with a normal attack before using your E... Right, we already got one. That's the, the second. Third. 
third, fourth, fifth, right? And we get five pretty easily. All right, let's get into his passes. Let's start with this one. When you hit an opponent with your normal charge attacks, you have a chance to obtain the descent effect. Next time you dash in midair, you don't consume your like green stamina thing, and it launches arrows that deal a little bit of damage to enemies. So there's two issues with that. The main issue is that it's unfortunately unreliable, and the biggest issue that it has is basically just that it's not that much damage. So is it really worth doing? From what I've seen, even with combos that like don't use dash too often to like wait until you have it guaranteed and whatever, it doesn't seem like it's worth because as much as like you don't consume dash from accelerating once you have it active, you still consume your points from like just being in your e-state doing things just right because you lose just you just lose points over time and you still lose those points over time while you're doing your dash right it doesn't extend your duration and from what i've tested it seems like the time that you lose doing your dash is less dps than if you just kept attacking for most combos now that being said obviously if you need to dash to dodge an attack being able to get that free dash which i'm going to talk about like in a second probably here if you need to dash to dodge an attack then being able to dash without losing uptime is nice but it's not like it's not something you ever you ever want to do it's just you don't get punished too much for having to dodge attacks that's kind of it oh uh, we can talk about his combos now you basically have a few choice a few choices right you basically either normal attack spam charge attack spam or n2c spam those are your three baseline options you can do a, like some mix and matches you can do something else but generally those are the three that i'll that you'll get gravitate towards in your normal attack spam if you're using his set you kind of like opening with a charge attack before starting your normal attacks this account has c1 which kind of fucks with the breakpoints but we can kind of pretend that we did a charge attack and got the passive before Behold. Yeah, so you get six and three. If you do charge attacks, now unfortunately C1 is gonna mess with that because it increases charge attack attack speed, but whatever. Right, I got an N1 after the 6 and 2s and 2 Cs, but generally you don't. Generally you just get 6 and 2 C as well. 6 and 2 C. And now with charge attacks, there's a little bit more variance to it. Again, right, I have the attack speed from it, so I'm gonna get more than you should. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Without C1, most of the times you'll get 12 or 13, with 13 not being that difficult, and it's technically possible to do 14 if you do them frame perfect. So I'll do 13 C. Now, looking at his motion values, so talent level nine is usually what I use for these. So your total motion value for normal attack spam is about 3,800. For N2C spam is about 4,100. And for charge attack spam is also about 4,100. Basic conclusion from this is that normal attack spam is a fucking grief. N2C spam and, and, and charge attack spam are about as good. Technically, if you can get the 14 charge attacks, it's a lot better. And if you fuck it up a little bit and you only get 12, it's quite a bit worse. Now, charge attack spam is AOE. N2C spam is only partly AOE. So these are generally the two combos you'll use one of the two. However, if you start stacking a lot of attack speed with Hyunjin C6, with his set, with his signature weapon, then that helps the normal attack spam more than it helps the others. So the gap starts being smaller and you start basically having an excuse to use normal attack spam instead. If you have his signature weapon, generally normal attack spam is going to be better overall because even though it's not necessarily higher motion value, you do get additional damage percent on your normal attacks from his weapon that you don't get on charge attacks. But basically, what this means is that as a baseline, he prefers doing charge attacks over normal attacks which means that as a base at a baseline his signature weapon isn't even that good on him we'll talk about it later but it turns out that if you're not in single target his signature isn't even his best weapon and even if you are in single target it's not his best weapon by a by that much the biggest issue with it is that it doesn't count as normal attack damage or as skill damage or as burst damage it doesn't have a damage type which means that a you can't use it to refresh buffs that work on skill and burst like for example the solar pearl as far as i'm aware they didn't actually change that a few yeah. minutes later it seems like it's still doesn't have a uh, normal or charge attack damage. It's still like, it seems like it doesn't, still doesn't have a like tag for damage type. So it doesn't proc solar pearl and it doesn't get increased by normal attack or charge attack damage. This passive is actually pretty good. I'm still not entirely sure how much he actually gains from the hydro thing. Baseline with C1, right? We've already shown this, but you can get technically up to six. Sometimes it stops at five. Sometimes you don't get the N3 out, but there we go, right? We got six and three with the C1. Now with hydro, one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a little N2 at the end. A decent amount more time, but yeah. Point being, with the Electro thing, you can end up in your requirement ranges that are more realistic to reach, but, and this is pretty important, it can still not be enough. Generate yeah, I'd say that, like, with time, it's... I dislike the Electro buff even more than I did initially. I think it's basically just completely useless. I think that most of the time, you're you're, you're just bursting every other rotation unless you have C6 Ferrazon. If you have C6 Ferrazon, it can be okay, but generally it's just meh. And most importantly, this doesn't give him resistance to interruption. I cannot stress how important it is for normal attack spammers yeah. to have um, at least one form of resistance to interruption. Otherwise, they will just yeah. fucking cry. The C4 is kind of bad, actually. A lot of the time, you don't really care that much about the buffs you don't have. And even if you do, you can't really rely on which one you're going to get. It's not bad, but it's unreliable, which makes it meh. Yeah. From my testing, I haven't really liked teams with one pyro and one cryo that much. Almost all the time, I'd recommend getting a pyro unit in, and then generally that's it. Which means that most of the time, what this is, is a uh, one out of three to get 20%, and then 20% crit rate and then a one out of three to be garbage or two out of three to be garbage because the electro is not particularly good i mean the hydro one can be fine i guess it's like one out of three to be the good one which is the cryo one one out of three to be an okay one which is the the hydro one and one out of three to be kind of just useless but point being for a constellation it's not all that great kagaras no it's still a stat stick it still has five star stats on a, on a weapon so it's still fine on him but it's not great so memory yeah uh one thing i probably should have addressed more is that most of the other good weapons on him are attack percent sticks and you kind of often end up running him with Bennett which means that just by virtue of being a stat stick with crit Kagaraz is generally up there as one of his best options even if it's not that insane. Lost Prayers True. is kind of in a similar boat without the condition. It's kind of just a stat stick it works mm -hmm. on both normal and charge attacks but it's not really amazing anyway. I'd say I probably underrated yeah, uh, Lost Prayers a little bit here I didn't really look into N2C spam very much, so I expected it to be so that if you don't like get charge attack combos very well, if they're difficult to do, then you just want a normal attack. But N2C is kind of just better in almost every situation, unless you have like a lot of attack speed. And that kind of makes it so that even if you go for his signature weapon, like signature weapon, normal attack spam versus Lost Prayers N2C spam. Lost Prayers is actually better than I expected it to be in that comparison. So yeah, I would say that overall, I underrated Lost Prayers on him a little bit, or rather overrated the bell. Uh, Dorogotel is a very interesting weapon because it's never been good on anyone before. <laughs> yeah, Dorogotel is actually very solid. If you end up using Dorogotel, generally instead of doing 13 charge attacks, you'll do 12 charge attacks with two normal attacks. So N1 and then six charge attacks and then N1 and then six charge attack just so that you can keep up the part of the passive that you gain from using normal attacks and if you do that then n1 6c n1 6c right so that's two normal attacks and then 12 charge attacks which is a bit harder to do than just 13 charge attacks but it's actually more motion value <laughs> <laughs> Often, because it's a bit harder, instead of getting 12 charge attacks, you'll only get 11, which is a bit less. But even then, it's still better than normal attack spam. And it's just a solid combo overall, right? Like, it's not the end of the world. It's it's not a bad combo. But yeah, so you don't actually lose much damage from weaving the normal attacks to keep the Dodoko Tails passive up. And because his charge attack combo is actually something that you want to use pretty often, even his N2C combo, like, you can do this with Dodoko and you still get this, but you get a bunch of damage on your charge attacks, whatever. Point being, Doroko is actually a very solid option for him. It's not that insane if you play him with Bennett because it gives a lot of attack, which obviously doesn't scale very well with the Bennett buff, but it's just, it's a very solid option for him overall. I'm, I'm not sure if I'd actually put the Bell above Lost Prayers. It depends. They're both about as good. I'd probably put Gagaraz above Skyward and Memory just because I've basically only been playing him in teams with Bennett. I think that his teams with Bennett are a lot better than his teams without. For the same reason, Doroko Tails would probably not be quite as high maybe solar pearl over it i put solar pearl low because it's a battle pass weapon and it's not even that great of an option on him but it's probably still generally better to use than doroko if you're using bennett uh that being said this is still like a fine fine ranking overall that you can like if you follow this you're not going to be using a garbage weapon you'll be fine let's now move on to artifact sets let it be known i do this reluctantly so this is shimanawa's so this is his signature set it's like a somewhere between a seven and ten percent increase let me go find the these sheets and update them with actual recorded combos. Shimanawas is better. Here's the thing, okay? The biggest thing about Shimanawas is that it does have a big caveat. Let's get our energy back and show you what the problem can be. You get your first rotation, whatever. I'm not gonna cast my other buffs for the first rotation, but you swap into him.
Cast your burst. You get your stuff. And as you can see, I didn't lose energy here because I didn't actually have the 15 or more energy that you need to proc Shimanawas. You're reliant on getting your fav proc on your Zhongli and making sure that you also get your Bennett stuff, Bennett energy, and you are more reliant on RNG if you use Shimanawas because sometimes you just won't get the 15 energy you need to use your burst. Because of that, I don't like Shimanawas that much, but it, it is worth noting that if you're doing charge attacks, right, specifically if you are using charge attacks and either you're fighting enemies that drop a lot of energy or you have multiple Fives on your team and you generate enough energy while you're off of off of Wanderer so that he has that guaranteed 15 to get the Shimanawas, then Shimanawas can actually be better. And I think even more importantly, a lot of people have good Shimanawas because they farmed Emblem for a while. So the fact that it can actually be better than his best in slot or than his signature set is kind of like, it's very relevant because I know that a lot of people have at least a decent Shimanawas lying around. But yeah, the main reason for that is because his signature set, it gives him 55% normal and charge stack damage 15 percent skill and burst damage right because it's 40 percent normal in charge and then 15 animo so it goes to 55 for his normal in charge and it goes to 15 for the rest and attack speed but if you're doing charge attack spam the attack speed doesn't do anything unless it's attack speed from his c1 that says it affects his charge attacks attack speed doesn't actually affect his charge attacks and so shimanawas can just end up being better if you just spam charge attacks but like i said right you do need to be able to get your 15 energy to proc it after using your burst and uh, it can actually make it so that you get your burst every third rotation instead of every other rotation in which case it's just about as good or slightly worse but basically right the the, the main takeaway from this is that shimanawas is actually a good option for him that can under like some circumstances in some situations be better than his signature set i also don't like two piece two piece i think that the bonus you get from his set or from four piece shimanawas is enough to justify going for those as a set bonus over two piece two piece he doesn't have anyone that like synergizes with him incredibly well but he also doesn't have like has a lot of options that are pretty solid if we want to like actually get into this we are going to have to talk about how good i expect him to be i expect him to be pretty good i don't expect him to be anywhere close to the kind of stuff you'd see on nahida he is a hyper carry but his numbers seem to be balanced in a way that he's like pretty okay yeah i don't think i agree with that anymore i mean okay the language that i use in my pre-releases is very careful because if i say the word good without nuancing it in any way then it might lead to people thinking that that the character is like a good pull from a meta standpoint, like an, the, an optimal use of their primo gems. And they might end up pulling for a character whose playstyle they're not that much into and whose character they're not that much into just because they think that he's a good character. Because some people care about having good characters. But when it comes from like optimal uses of primo gems, having a character that's good isn't optimal. There's too many characters that are actually very strong for it to ever really be optimal to pull for a character that's just good. But I know that if I just say good without nuancing it, there's some people that aren't used to how I nuance my things. They're not used to the kind of content that I make. They're watching the video for the first time and that are gonna see this and be like, wow, this person whose opinion is somewhat respected by theory crafters says that this unit is good. It means that I need to go for them, right? And I don't want that to happen. So I always use language that is very, I guess, euphemistic. If I think a unit is a strong pull that like is going to be good going to have competitive somewhat strong meta teams i'm going to call them pretty okay pretty okay in a pre-release for me means i think he's a somewhat strong character that's going to have competitive teams i've kind of changed my mind on that the biggest issue that i've experienced with the testing that i've made on him is that his teams are in general just so energy hungry now he might not be all that reliant on his burst but he very much likes to be paired with Farizan, and Farizan is reliant on her burst. Not only that, but without her constellation six, she generates dog shit amount of particles. It's two particles for her E. And it's only if you do your charge shot, which a lot of people end up skipping because it's not really fun to do a charge shot on a support. Right? Like that, that's the reality. People who play 
Karazhan often just do not do the charge shot, just like people who play Sarah often do not do the charge shot. He himself generates four to five particles during his skill. As it turns out, getting six to seven, and sometimes just four to five because you don't do your charge shots particles, from two characters, including your on-fielder, is a very, very small amount. Not just when it comes to their energy requirements, but also when it comes to other members of your team's energy requirements. In my experience, I've actually often struggled getting my Bennett Burst back up if I play him as a solo pyro unit in the team. The, the C0 Farazan account that I've been testing on has 260 ER on Bennett, and I have been relatively often in situations where Bennett's Burst, after using his E, is almost full but not quite there. That kind of forces you, it doesn't like actually force you, but it very much is a heavy incentive to go away from some of the solo element teams like one pyro, one cryo, or one pyro, one geo, and go into double pyro or maybe double cryo just so that your pyro or cryo units can just fucking get their burst back. Now obviously losing that flexibility to some extent is pretty rough and it makes it a lot more clunky to play. The fact that if I don't do two Bennett E's per rotation I can't get my Bennett burst every rotation it makes it feel a lot more clunky because the team isn't focused around Bennett so having to remember to actually battery your Bennett sometimes you you forget like some people obviously won't forget but it is it is a thing that you are going to need to remember i'm not saying this to say that he's bad i'm saying this to say that without constellation six on farazan your er requirements are so high and so tight and reliant on you doing exactly the right things that he effectively becomes almost more difficult to play than carries that have er requirements themselves it's more difficult to battery wanderers supports than it is to battery a carry that needs energy and that goes a lot into how most people experience the game. People don't like having to battery a unit that isn't even the one doing damage on their team. It's not something that's pleasant, and it's not something that feels good to do for most people. As such, I think it's very important to mention that, both in a pre-release and in a post-release, so that people don't end up wishing for a unit and then being disappointed with their performance because they're confronted with a problem that they didn't know about, right? So I'd rather tell them about it so that they can make the decision for themselves. Obviously, it's not a problem without a solution. It does have a solution. Just play better. For your fav, just get lucky. There, there there, are solutions for it. I say just get lucky, right? Forehead, haha. But if you get unlucky, worst case scenario, you can reset. Some people don't mind resetting. Some people do. But these are still issues that are important to know about if you're going to wish for him. So if you do rotation on him, here we didn't get a fav prong, but it happens. Right? Just barely, but we get it. And here, if we didn't get the fab rock from Zhongli, from his e whole E there, as you saw, right, we relied on catching those particles on Farazan to get her burst back. If we didn't get the fab rock, which, I mean, to some extent, it's very hard to give Zhongli 100% crit rate, and that's assuming you even have R5 fab. If you don't have R5 fab, you can't guarantee it at all. Well, then Farazan at 319.8% ER wouldn't have had enough there. So I would have need to change my rotation and do E charge attack before the burst. I'm hoping that you can see what the problem can end up being. And it's not that he's bad, it's just that the energy requirements can be very difficult to meet. Her energy is generated from when her explosion after charge attack after E hits enemies, just like Sarah. The thing is, if you don't have C6, that only happens once for a rotation. Maybe twice if you do two in your downtime, but it can be actually be pretty hard to do two. So it's generally- Yeah, so another thing that you might not know is that even if you were able to manage to do two, right? Let's say you do your E and then you hold your charge shot and then you do charge shot, E charge shot, in order to like make it so that her C6 can still hit often, but not generate like too much energy, they gave her an ICD on particle generation, which means that even if you fit two charge attacks in, either from your constellation one or from like doing your stuff at, at, at we'll see about like with that. intervals like this. Second one didn't generate energy. So that's another thing to keep in mind for her f 
garbage energy generation. Because he has a lot of flexibility in his teams, instead of going through the kind of teams that he has, I'll instead just go through the units that he can work with. I think that Bennett is obviously Pog. Well, actually, another thing I kind of want to add to Bennett, the way that Wanderer's Kid is designed is he kind of just has good motion values, but he has basically nothing in his kit to just increase his stats. Technically, he has the, like, Ascension passive, but it can actually be pretty difficult to get two things from his Ascension passive, so generally you only get one, which means that, like, as a baseline, he has high emotion value, but relatively low effective attack. And as a character that has a relatively low effective attack, but, but high emotion value, that means that he benefits quite a bit from getting buffs. If he were to gain Bennett's attack buff in this situation, he would instead gain 66% attack or 66% damage. If you are to start with a pyro buff, assu assuming you get the pyro buff to begin with, it's going to be a little bit less. But assuming you gain the pyro buff from having Bennett, it's going to be more, obviously. So 936. So it's closer to about 50%. But still, right, it's a lot more than you would gain from someone like Hutao. If you, if you assume that you start with no buffs at all, it's closer to 72%. So all of this to say, because he does doesn't have too many external attack buffs in his baseline kit or his quote unquote signature support with Farazhan, then that kind of makes it so that he has inherent synergy with a hyper carry playstyle, and you kind of want to give him attack buffs instead of giving him supports that also do deal damage. Because of that, or at least partly because of that, I've enjoyed the teams that actually do focus on hyper carry Wanderer, and I've had more success with the teams that focus on hyper carry Wanderer than the teams that I think that Changling is okay with Bennett. I would say that I've kind of changed my mind on Changling. Not that she's not good in him or with him, but you're not going to get good VV uptime if you put VV on Farazhan, which means that if you play him with Changling, you kind of have to play him on VV, which hurts his personal damage a pretty decent amount. And from what I've seen and from what I've looked at, especially because you end up without really the opportunity to use a shield, I would say that I would generally just recommend using Toma instead. Venti, very good in AoE. Wanderer's Charge Attack seems to hit pretty easily all enemies in Venti Burst. Okay, here's the thing about Wanderer's Charge Attack that I haven't talked about yet. It staggers a lot, and it staggers outward. If you've ever played Shao, you'll know the outward stagger kind of meh, because it means that if you're standing in the middle of the enemies, you're pushing them away from each other and you're making it harder to hit them AoE. With Shao, let's say there are three enemies here, right? right? In a triangle here, right? One here, one here, one here. At the very least with Shao, you can just go here and plunge here and it's going to hit all of them and at least stagger them in the same direction. But with Wanderers, because his charge attack auto targets onto an enemy, then it's going to have to be on one of those three enemies, which means that if it's here, you're staggering your enemies in three different directions. Or sometimes here if they don't move that much. Point being, against enemies that have stagger animations that push them back a lot, his charge attacks will ungroup them very, very quickly. In the current abyss, it's not that bad. We have these, which actually do have pretty relevant stagger, but on the first chamber, right, this guy dies in only like a few charge attacks, so you don't end up struggling too much because by the time they're ungrouped, at least this one's probably dead. And then these two, at least this one, very aggressively runs towards you, so it, it won't be that bad. If you play him on the first side of this chamber, these enemies basically don't get staggered, and then it's single target. And then if you play him here, the Rift Town Wells basically don't get staggered. They get staggered like slightly upwards, but not really backwards, so it doesn't really ungroup them, which means that against the Rift Towns, you'll also generally be mostly okay. Which means that this abyss is kind of specifically designed, so you don't really notice that problem. But if you tried him before the abyss reset, when we have the hub, husks, you would have noticed that after like two charge attacks, you go from hitting four husks to hitting one because they got staggered away from each other. And it is something to keep in mind when it comes to his AoE that unless the Abyss is specifically designed to make him feel good, which is generally the case when a character is on banner, generally they're not gonna put an Abyss that makes the character that you can spend money on right now feel bad because they want you to spend money. So they'll try to make an Abyss that makes him feel makes them feel good. So that's the case right now, right? It's a pretty good Abyss for him. But when the Abyss isn't designed to sell him, there are going to be some AoE situations that feel really, really bad. Jean's constellations almost make me feel like they knew what they wanted to do with Scaramouche back in 1.0. Yeah, I've changed my mind. The attack speed doesn't really matter that much because most of the time you're doing charge attack spam, not normal really attack good spam. for Scaramouche. Or and then her C4 also doesn't matter that much because if you're ever playing against enemies that get staggered backwards, they're gonna get outside of the of the of Jean's burst and they won't really be able to get back in because when they try to get back in, the Jean's burst is gonna hit them and fucking stagger them back away. And they only get the animal 
lower res decrease if they're inside the burst and it doesn't actually have a duration so as soon as they leave they don't have this anymore which means that the c4 is actually not even that good either it's not terrible if you're against an enemy that doesn't get staggered it's fine but it's actually not that good it's pretty situational i'd say if you don't have any cons on her i don't really see the point of running her over someone like bennett yeah. if even have... if you have constellations on her i generally wouldn't recommend actually playing gene another thing that i want to add is if you're playing triple animal it helps a lot with your energy requirements on your ferrazon if the third animal unit you're using is venti it doesn't just help on your ferrazon it also helps on your last unit which is generally going to be someone like bennett and if you infuse venti's burst with pyro then that makes bennett's energy cost go from 60 to 45 and yeah you're getting less total like particles right this would be from Zhong Li. you'd be getting like three but like it makes it so that your non non-animal unit if they're as long as they're non-geo get easier er requirements and it also makes it so that your animal units also get easier er requirements like with one e this is literally one e and it makes it go from 310 in this specific situation to 275 but this is obviously a lot more realistic to do 40 percent with a four piece emblem is not that difficult it's 10 percent per piece it's a lot more doable it's only eight subs total ish so yeah yunjin's biggest issue is that she is very very energy hungry so again right yunjin has the same potential problem as a lot of units that you would want to put in wanderer teams if you're not going for two geo units it's very very difficult to get yunjin's burst back and because she doesn't have multi hits and she's pretty reliant on her fav proc then that means that you're reliant on just staying on yunjin until you get you get your fav proc right if we look at the energy requirements for a unit like yunjin assuming you play wanderer ferrazan bennett yunjin which is a team that i've seen being used for speedruns i think because in speedruns you don't need to get your burst back you can just you just do one rotation which is your requirements that are of around 240 now it's doable but unlike ferrazan and unlike bennett the damage buff that yunjin provides is something that scales directly with her stats and how good her artifacts are so the more er you have to give her the less defense she has and this is assuming you proc your fav which means you're probably going to need crit rate as well and once you start factoring in crit rate for the fav and er to just reach your energy requirements the amount of defense you can actually get isn't that high and she starts losing value so she's actually another character that is just sometimes just not functional at low investment and at high investment can become functional but it's still not like all that insane because if you're not in single target her buff doesn't do shit if you're an aoe you want to use your charge attack anyways so this doesn't matter because yunjin's buff is, is to normal attacks only but then on top of that her particle generation is also pretty fucking shitty which is going to increase the energy requirements of the rest of your team as well because of that i don't like yunjin too much but she is a character that if you're doing speedruns against bosses so it's single target speedruns she is actually pretty good Zhongli, okay she's going to shield Zhongli's good that being said if you don't have the cryo buff yet lila is actually pretty nice as well and if you don't have the pyro buff yet toma is actually pretty nice as well especially if you have a few constellations on him i i ironically think that if you're not at high investment it's easier to get away with toma <laughs> now obviously toma is a lot better at high constellations than he is at low constellations but unlike ferrazon he didn't just get released this patch which means that it's there's a better chance that you have a that you have constellations on toma than that you have constellations on ferrazon i would say that if you have constellations on toma i would actually recommend him over jungly in almost every situation and if you if you don't have constellations on toma he's something that you can consider just because it helps with your bennett energy requirements a lot of people consider putting units on their teams like lila for example that i've talked about just because it gives you the ascension one bonus the thing is it can actually be pretty difficult to get multiple ascension bonus you have to do your setup properly uh which changes the order in which you can uh use your stuff which often can eat into how much uptime you have on wanderer with all of your buffs active with toma instead of relying on a specific setup you just get power resonance which is almost as much as his ascension one gives him right his ascension one is 30 percent attack power resonance is 25 it's almost as much not much of a difference but yeah official bocage beto bocage if official i think if you're going to be playing official beto there's just no point to playing wanderer i talked about the value that wanderer can have by just having high motion values and just not that many attack buffs that that makes it so that he can gain a lot of values from buffers the thing is if you don't actually give him any buffers his damage is kind of pitiful like it's not very good the way that his damage is like packed inside of his kit makes it so that when paired with supports that are focused on increasing his damage he can actually hold his own as a hyper carry but without those supports his damage is really not that great and if you're playing 
him with special Beto, you can't really give him those supports anymore. There's just not enough slots on your team. And with pretty average damage and no utility, that's not very good for Taser. Taser would much rather have good utility. Singto, good. Yelan, good. Uh, Singto and Yelan can be good, single target option. I'd say that the biggest issue that I've had with them for my testing is just that they're not dedicated buffers, which means that they'll generally synergize better with other units than him. Yelan specifically does have a bit of buffing, which makes her ma makes it so that she doesn't feel that bad, but she doesn't provide any damage or any resistance to interruption. So if you try to play Bennett Ferris on Yelan, you don't have a shielder or any form of resistance to interruption, which feels really bad because you also don't really have the crowd control that Venti would provide. When it comes to teams without a shielder, I kind of did like Venti, Venti Bennett Ferris on, but the main reason is because with Venti, you can keep them from attacking. So you don't need a shielder as much. You don't get that from Yelan, so you'd need to play Yelan and Singto, and then at that point, that means that there's not as many things you can put on your team to buff Wanderer's damage. A little bit more of an elaboration on this. Your flex flex, generally, you either want to focus on damage stuff, so you can go for, like, Bennett plus whatever. Bennett Changling, Bennett Rosaria, Bennett Lila, pretty good, actually. I've kind of changed my mind on this, that your requirements feel almost impossible to get to if you don't have C6 Ferris on. If you do have C6 Ferris on, teams like this end up being a little bit easier to do and a bit more doable, so it's something that you can consider, but without it, I wouldn't recommend it. You can go for an off-field core of like double electro or double cryo. And like I said, I've also kind of changed my mind on double electro and double cryo. I feel like at that point, you're better off just not running Wanderer. Uh, but yeah, so generally I like Bennett plus Shield Flex. Yeah, that's kind of generally uh, the team yeah, that so I'd recommend. Right, so uh, Wanderer, Ferrazon, Bennett, Toma, Wanderer, Ferrazon, Bennett, Zhongli are generally the two teams that I've been liking the most. I think that Bennett, Venti, Ferrazon is also a very solid team for him. About about Ferrazon, I, I didn't end up doing a pre-release for her, but post-release Ferrazon, TF Ferrazon is a lot more fun than I thought it would be. I'm actually kind of enjoying it, so I started leveling my Ferrazon. I didn't pull for Wanderer on my own account, but TF Ferrazon has actually been really fun. If you have Ferrazon's Constellation 1, it means that you can use two Hurricane Arrows every time you E, and her charge shots and Hurricane Arrow do not have internal cooldown, which means that A, you get a bunch of Squirrels, and B, you get a bunch of potential Electro Chain Reactions. If you're playing, like, Aggravate, then you're those swirls in AoE can trigger Aggravate, which is going to proc your TF set, which it means that you can proc your TF off of your E, and then off of your charge shot, and then off of another charge shot, and then you have your E again. So you E, charge shot, charge shot, E, charge shot, charge shot, E, charge shot, charge shot, E, charge shot, charge shot. It's actually kind of fun. I've been enjoying it. I don't think it's that great, but it definitely is fun. The last thing I want to address on the post release is Wanderer versus Xiao. I don't know if my editors ended up including it in the day one first impressions video, but it is a thing that I did on day one. I played Wanderer and then I played Chao, and I think it's a pretty important thing to talk about. I actually don't think Wanderer is really better than Chao. I think that people in general have been underestimating Chao. Now, by releasing a support that synergizes with Animo Hyper Carry, they also released a support that synergizes with Chao. And from my testing, both with C0 and with C6 Ferrazon, I've kind of just enjoyed the Chao team and had better results with the Chao team than the Wanderer teams. The main reason is when it comes to single target damage, Xiao has like the bonk trick where mid-air plunge attacks do like an, an additional instance of damage, right? Charge attacks have the low and high plunge, but they also have plunge damage. And this is what happens if you hit enemies mid-air. So when it comes to Xiao, he doesn't just get 404 on a high plunge. He gets, if he manages to hit the enemy mid-air, which is on a lot of enemies, pretty easy to do. He gets 566. But that makes it so in single, like against bosses in single target situations, Xiao's motion value kind of skyrockets to a lot higher than it is in AoE. And and it also skyrockets above Wanderer. And when it comes to AoE, because his AoE is bigger and you can decide where the center is, if the enemies get staggered away, Xiao also feels better because you can actually decide where you're staggering them towards. Wanderer does have something over Xiao, which is he himself isn't as burst reliant and his rotations can be cut short a lot more easily. In the current Abyss, right, like I said, this is an Abyss that is kind of catered to Wanderer. Now, obviously, part of that means, well, be careful evaluating Wanderer based on how he performs this abyss. But that doesn't mean that there will never be other content that Wanderer is good in, right? They just made it so that the content that Wanderer is good in is all of the content this abyss. But generally, there will still be some situations where Wanderer is and feels good. And those situations are basically AoE against enemies that don't get staggered very far. So like the Rift Hounds. Uh, single target against very mobile bosses, like the Perpetual Mechanical Array and the Golden Wolf Lord. Because generally with a Golden Wolf Lord, it can be hard to keep attacking him 
him because he goes in the air a lot of the time. Well, with Wanderer, his tracking both on normal attack and charge attack is actually very, very good against mobile enemies. Even if they're in the air, you can still attack them. Same thing for the PMA. You can keep attacking him while he's doing his weird ass fucking shit. And he doesn't have, you don't have to deal with like the bullshit coding on the PMA's hitbox where sometimes you use your skills and it physically hits the PMA, but it doesn't actually hit the damage hitbox. So you don't actually get particles or deal damage, right? Which is actually a pretty big problem for Xiao, right? Xiao's E sometimes will just not generate energy against the PMA because it hit a part of the PMA that doesn't have a hitbox. Well, Golden Wolf Lord, Xiao's plunges won't always hit him because sometimes he's in the air. So this Abyss is actually a very good example of the kinds of situations where a Wanderer can feel better than Xiao. I would say that previous Abyss, right? Like right before the reset, which is when he came out, that Abyss was an example of situations where Xiao feels a lot better than Wanderer. And this one is an example of situations where Wanderer feels better than Xiao. When it comes to just strict numbers output, Xiao does better. His motion value plus his like buff on his burst uh, for damage percent just makes him like a decent bit above Wanderer, especially in single target where he can get the midair plunge. However, he also needs to be on field for longer, which means that your rotations will be slower. Your DPS does end up being higher, but it's not higher by an insurmountable amount. All in all, I'd say that I would slightly favor Xiao between the two. If you think about unit value as like a tier list, they'd be in the same tier. They don't have significantly different returns on their stuff. And uh, yeah, like they're both, they're both kind of just, okay, I guess. One thing I want to add about Wanderer that I forgot to say, if you guys watch, I think it was in the Ganyu Ask the Jeff, you'll know that even though like overworld isn't that important, a character being comfortable in overworld is still like a pretty valuable thing that a lot of people actually do care about. And because basically all of my Wanderer testing was just Abyss testing, testing his teams, testing how well he performs and all, I didn't really actually test him out in overworld. But after being told that his the overworld experience with him was actually pretty comfortable, I thought about it and I was like, you know what? Yeah, that kind of makes a lot of sense. Even though if he wants to reach like the good DPS stuff, you're gonna need to get the bursts on your supports back. He himself doesn't need it. And in overworld, you kind of don't need that much DPS, which means that you can kind of just not use your supports bursts. And he's got just like a very nice, no effort, just press E and start hitting the enemies. So yeah, that's like one other upside that he has over a bunch of the other units, for example, Xiao, is that his overall experience is a lot more comfortable. So just one thing to, to keep in mind if you are considering him, if you don't care about Abyss that much, and you just care about just pulling a unit you like and then not feeling like shit in overworld. Yeah, I mean, Wanderer is a pretty, pretty solid unit to go for. So I think that does it for the Wanderer post-release. Like I said, I do think that I've overrated him a bit in, in the pre-release, but that isn't to say that he's unplayable. He's still a strong-ish hyper carry. Hyper carries in general, unless they're given a lot of tools, will end up often performing worse than non-hyper carries because, well, A, Dendro gave so many teams just really, really high floors for reaction teams. And B, there's just a lot of very strong supports for all field damage dealers that don't synergize really well with hyper carry playstyles. And the existence of snapshot makes it so abusing buffs isn't something that only hyper carries can do. Other characters can also abuse buffs. Point being, hyper carries need to be given a, a bit of a kick, a bit of like an additional upside to them for them to really be worth from a meta standpoint, pulling over supports that synergize well with your teams. And that thing in, in, in Wanderer's case is basically Farazan C6. If you don't have Farazan C6, I'd say that Wanderer is probably a downgrade over the other team options that you could do with Forsar characters. If you do have Farazan C6, he can be an upgrade in some situations. But that will be it for the post-release. I hope you learned a thing or two. I hope you're not going to be too angry at me for not encouraging people to spend money for C6 Farazan. If you want to see these post-releases and pre-releases live, you can come check me out at twitch.tv slash 77 I'll see you guys around.